the opportunity to present here tonight. It's a real honour for me. Um, we've talked about or mentioned the Cooperative Research Centre program. Who's heard of the CRC program? It's only a handful of people. So this was a, an initiative under Bob Hall um, about 27 years ago it started. There's been about 200 CRCs uh, over that time. Um, and it's really the main funding method or vehicle by which the federal government gets our cream of the research crop working with industry to the advancement of the economy. So in Australia we're very good at scientific research and we're very good at publications, but we're very poor at industry working with our best scientists. Uh, countries like Israel are some of the best in the world at that time, uh, European countries. So that's what the CRC program is about. It's industry working with researchers, working with governments. So I do acknowledge the support we receive from the Commonwealth CRC program. We're mainly going to focus on 25% of that, the food waste area. As we go through tonight's talk, um, or to today's menu, as I would rather call it, we'll talk about the global challenge, so really set the scene of what's happening around the world, why we need to reduce food waste, um, talk about food waste in Australia, what we know so far, and then talk about the organisation which um, I've uh, established over the last few years. Throughout the talk, we'll move between food loss and food waste. Um, as a collective term, they are regarded as food waste, but food loss is before it gets to the consumer, and food waste is thereafter, if you need that definition. So I will present a couple more uh, recent or accurate figures than what was presented in that video. And the first is that the global food challenge is now up to $1.65 trillion a year. So that's just the value of the food that is grown for human consumption that is thrown away. Now that figure, if it rings a bell to any economists in the room, is the same, about, same as our gross domestic product or our GDP. So we take the value that we create in a country, a wealthy country like Australia, and throw that food away. And there's a big difference where food waste occurs around the world. So in the developed world, one billion people waste 56%, and if you remember back to that graphic before, they waste it at the end of the supply chain. And what that means is you've got all the resources that have gone into getting that food to the consumer um, that have also get wasted. Where in the developing world, six billion people lose 44%, and that's for entirely different reasons. In the developing world, it's about the infrastructure, it's about the harvesting techniques, it's about cold chain and storage and a whole bunch of other reasons. So this paints that picture in a slightly different way, and these are figures from the FAO, or Food and Agriculture Organisation in Rome. Australians are, unfortunately, some of the worst food wasters in the world. So you heard the figure in the video that a third of food is wasted, that's the global figure. In Australia, we're above 40%, we're 42%, according to the FAO. And we, what you can see here is that nearly all of that food, or 60% plus, is wasted right at the end of the supply chain uh, as a consumption phase. Where in countries like Sub-Saharan Africa and, um, and uh, in Asia, it's a very different picture. Most of that food is wasted at the production stage for the reasons I mentioned just before. In terms of what's wasted, uh, what's lost versus, uh, and what's wasted, cereals are the, the um, most calories that are lost uh, through food loss and waste. And um, fruit and vegetables are um, the highest food category in terms of weight that are lost and wasted. And I'll go into some Australian data on that uh, in a minute. What's really alarming though is in places like Australia or North America, if you see Oceania here, it's including New Zealand and Canada and so on, we waste about four times the amount of calories per day than our nearest neighbours in Southeast Asia and countries like Indonesia. And that in itself uh, is something that just can't continue. Now, when we talk about a sustainable food system, of course we've got to feed a population of near 10 billion people um, by 2050. And one of the, the best ways that we can achieve that is just through reducing food waste. Who's heard of the, sorry, and I do give interactive talks, so you do need to participate. Who's heard of the Sustainable Development Goals? Quick show of hands, again, half a dozen or so. These are the goals that came out in 2017, which governments are really structuring 
a lot of their policy around. And it's the goals by which all the developed and developing world is supposed to be trying to live by so we can have a sustainable developed world. Um, one of the goals here is goal 12, um, and one of the targets in goal 12 is 12.3, uh, and this is to halve global food waste by 2030. That's a huge undertaking, but it is possible. So how are we tracking so far on that? You can see these shaded countries here. These are the countries that have committed to this goal or committed to similar goals um, to try and reduce food waste by 50% by 2030. Now, the observant among you will notice that some of the most populated countries in the world, in China and India and so on, have not committed to this goal yet. And so we've still got a long way to go before we can say that half the population is committed to this. So why should we reduce food waste? Why should we care? You've seen some of these figures in the video. There's 800 million people going hungry around the world. Um, and so that's whether they're unnourished or the fact that you know, even in Australia, 4 billion people throughout, sometime throughout the year don't know where their next meal is coming from. They're food insecure. Yet, uh, as you saw in the figures, over a billion people each year overeat. In terms of environmental reasons, if food waste was a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. So food waste rotting in landfill, most people just don't make the connection that is such a big emitter of greenhouse gases. About 10% of all greenhouse gases just come from food waste rotting in landfill. And so if it was its own country, it would be ahead of very populated countries like India and Russia. I think an even, even easier way of um, depicting this is that food loss and waste rotting in landfill emits nearly six times the global greenhouse gases than the aviation industry around the world. Six times. And I, you know, I grew up as a, 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 a greenie in many ways, you know, environmentally conscious young kid, and um, always thought that you know, the aviation industry was appalling. And, and unfortunately, I have to fly a lot these days. But um, in terms of its uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but in fact, food waste rotting in landfill is six times worse. And of course, one of the main reasons that we want to change this behaviour is because economically, it makes sense. So there's been a very large study done to 700 companies, 17 countries um, around the world, around what they received in terms of their return on investment for initiating um, food loss and waste programs. So these are supermarket chains, they're restaurant chains, they're hotel chains and things like that. And the average return here is 14 to 1. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly can't get 14 to 1 out of my bank. And so you know, this makes for a smart investment. For countries though, it's around 250 to 1. So for every dollar the UK government has invested in trying to reduce food waste, they've seen 250 dollar at all. 250 pound return. But of course, it's not only, well, economics isn't only about the dollars, it's also around things like conserving the resources. As I said, all the estimates that we've put in um, so far and the dollar figures I've mentioned don't actually include all the other resources, the water and the land and fertiliser that are lost when they waste food. Improving reputation is a really big one. Products that really focus on reducing their food waste and promoting that and promoting their environmental credentials can often get up to a 60% higher um, profit margin on some of those products. Complying with laws and also upholding ethics, becoming particularly this upholding ethics becoming increasingly more important with a lot of big companies um, reporting their corporate social responsibility uh, obligations each year. What's amazing is that um, they now believe that uh, food waste is a trillion dollar a year opportunity. So yes, it's $1.65 trillion problem, but it's also a massive opportunity. And unfortunately that opportunity, or well, the problem is gonna get worse before it gets better, um, but the opportunity will also increase. So a lot of what I talk about tonight, what the CRC is doing is really in this area, is supply chain efficiency, collaboration, where we need to be going, and we know this, is more in the awareness area. And that's certainly part of things like tonight, giving public talks, 
just raising the awareness around the problem. So, food loss and waste in Australia. This picture here was from a potato pack house uh, just north of Adelaide, I won't mention the company. But have a guess how much, or what the rejection rate is uh, in a pack house for potatoes. 45%. So just under half of what they grow gets downgraded or rejected outright. Um, and so can you imagine if you're a producer and nearly half of what you produce you have to throw away. You know, it's just unsustainable. The only thing in Australia is that we're very good at producing potatoes and so they are still economical. But for most other industries that wouldn't be sustainable. And this is what we eat versus what gets thrown away in terms of food. And this isn't just Australia, it's a couple of, you know, it's the Oceania study as well. But grain products. Now, we're incredibly efficient grain producers in this country. Yields left in the paddock are around 2 to 3%. So that's not where the loss occurs. The loss in grain products is predominantly around bread. And if you talk to the big bakers, the Goodman Fielders and, you know, George Weston and so on, they'll say for every loaf of bread they bake, they uh, bake another one to throw away. And that's because in the eastern states there's this crazy law where they can return all their baked bread at the end of the day, so they have to have a full shelf until the close time, and then all of that gets returned to the, to the bakers, and they've got very little option for what they can do with it. Some of it get turned, gets turned into breadcrumbs, some of it gets turned into animal feed, and most of it ends up in landfill. And that's just a crazy situation. Fortunately, South Australia, being a smart state, outlawed that quite a few years ago. And so in the South Australia, you can go into a supermarket at the end of the day, and that bread shelf may be a bit depleted, but that's actually a good thing. Seafood, there is a lot of um, waste in the seafood area. There's a lot of bycatch when we go after our target species. And most of that bycatch just gets thrown off the side of the boat and not used. And that's only weighs up in these loss estimates. Fruit and vegetables, so I mentioned before, is a big one. And uh, I'll talk, focus a little bit more on fruit and vegetables in the next couple of slides. Fortunately, meat and dairy are much more efficient supply chains. So we only see around 20% loss <coughs> with these commodities. But that's really fortunate because they're also the most carbon and water intensive in terms of all food production. So these are just some of the scenes you may be familiar with. Here, all these apples, and it could be in the Adelaide Hills, um, have just been you know, hit by hailstones. And this has happened then for the last two seasons in the Adelaide Hills. And so all those apples just get left to rot on the ground. This is a pack house in South Australia, uh, in the Riverland. Uh, a bit hard to see here, but they're all mandarins. They've all been marked, you know, put their stickers on and so on, but they've all been rejected still. I can spot a thing wrong with those mandarins, but they're all marked as waste and they'll go off to animal feed for zero gain. Uh, the manufacturing sector is also a big producer of food waste. And supermarkets as well. And this is a scene from a, <coughs> a French supermarket. The French supermarkets, and some of you may have heard about this, ban all food waste going to landfill uh, three or four years ago. It's now illegal. To, um, uh, to send any food waste to landfill. It's also illegal to pour chlorine on food waste out the back of a supermarket, which they all used to do. Unfortunately, they pushed all this food into the food charities who weren't equipped to deal with it at the time, and that's actually created another problem in itself. So it's not just as easy as giving all that food away because we need the infrastructure in place to handle it as well. And of course, we're all guilty of this. Well, some of us more than others, but getting rid of food on the plate, most of that food waste occurs at the consumer end, and this is something we really need to concentrate on as well. So in terms of fruit and vegetables, if we just take the FAO figures that were presented before and apply it to our um, uh, estimates of fruit and vegetable production in this country, we waste about $2.8 billion worth of fruit and vegetables each year. Now these estimates have been confirmed recently. In terms, um, oh sorry, uh, of primary production losses each year. In terms of something like cauliflowers, well, 37% of cauliflowers don't even leave the farm. And they get graded out for, well, some unharvested, some are packaging rejects, some are harvest rejects, 
It's on a field desk. Top of that, on a cauliflower, about 60% of the weight is actually in the leaves around it. They all get wasted as well. Although I was on a judging competition the other day around developing new foods from, from waste streams. And uh, this group from a um, local university developed wraps out of the cauliflower leaves and they're one of the most amazing things I've ever tasted. So that's what this organisation is about. Some real innovation <coughs> in food production. Of course, this 30 cent cent don't leave the farm, then we lose more at the supermarket level we lose, and we lose a lot more in the home. So it's only about 10 to, 10 to 20 per cent of cauliflowers grown are actually consumed. And we should be worried about this. You know, food waste averages $3,800 per household. This is a New South Wales study. That was quite an extensive study. Yet food insecurity is at crisis point. So $3,800, I mean, that in itself is a good family holiday each year. So a student of mine, um, Carlos Patea, did some estimates around what food waste was costing us in Australia. Uh, a couple of years ago because there had been individual studies at different sections of the supply chain but no one had worked out the total cost. Carlos's estimates or our estimates came out at around 18 to 20 billion dollars a year. Now to put that into the comparison that's around the same I believe that we gamble each year. It's also around the same cost that um, costs us in terms of con um, congestion on Australian roads in terms of lost productivity. Now, of course, we spend billions each year on trying to get people to work quicker and so on, so we don't lose that. Unfortunately, we're not spending the same amount of money on trying to reduce food waste. Fortunately, food waste got some uh, high-level high friends a number of years ago, and Anthony Pratt, uh, who was, uh, I think at the time, Australia's richest person, uh, has been very vocal in this area. In fact, the first food waste roundtable was held at his personal house in Melbourne. Uh, in 2017, and he backed, well, Busy Industries backed the development of the National Food Waste Strategy, which is great. Who's heard of The War on Waste? Yeah, it's been one of, excellent. It's been one of the most popular shows that the ABC has ever produced. It was produced on a fairly shoestring budget, uh, and it's on iView and gets reruns all the time. Um, and, and Craig's a fantastic person to work with as well. And this is our now treasurer, uh, Josh Frydenberg, back when he had a bit more hair, um, who really committed to the food waste strategy as well. So this is the National Food Waste Strategy. It was launched in November 2017. Well, this is the key table from it, uh, I should say. And you can see the different areas where the government wants us to focus on. Policy support, business improvement, market development and behavioural change. Now, a lot of these targets are now being met and um, a, lot of, a lot of them are being um, delivered by uh, the CRC that I run. There's others that um, I'll touch on in a minute. The baseline study has been done by a consulting firm. Um, so we are working our way down this list. But this is the big one here that I'll touch on at the end that's currently unfunded. So uh, earlier this year, uh, a um, consulting company called Arcadis um, produced this report, uh, and that's around uh, what food waste is in Australia. And it surprised a lot of us because why the, uh, the levels of primary production here are much higher than what we normally see uh, in other countries, and certainly a lot higher than what FAO reported for Australia. The rest is fairly consistent. A lot of this relates to crops like sugar cane which aren't grown in, in Europe and so on. So that disadvantages Australia in many ways because sugarcane being you know, a, a low value crop, a lot of it gets left in the paddock if the prices aren't right on the global stage or global market. And that means that we have high levels of primary production food waste here. In terms of uh, how it changes between the state, you can see here Queensland high levels of um, primary production waste. Again, that's that sugarcane. If you look at Victoria, high levels of food manufacturing waste, most of that's actually the dairy sector and whey, which is left over um, from the production of cheese. But uh, I think it's important to recognise that if we look at household food waste in South Australia, well, once again, we kind of win on that level, where we have the lowest per capita uh, food waste uh, of, um, of most of the states. And so we can certainly, and 
you know, that's a good reason why this CRC should be headquartered in South Australia as well. So just to finish off with, um, we'll talk about the property research then. So, so we started in mid last year, uh, on July 1 last year, but it took about five years to get this organisation funded. Uh, we went through various funding rounds which didn't, you know, governments changed and they didn't go ahead. Um, so it's taken a, a long time to, to get this organisation going. But um, and we are now, as I'll touch on later, the biggest food loss and waste research organisation in the world. And we're headquartered right here in Adelaide. And that in itself, I think, is something we're celebrating as well. In terms of the role of the CRC, it's quite simple. We want to maximise the environmental and economic and social returns from food waste. So this is the internationally accepted food recovery hierarchy and the aim of um, trying to manage food waste is to keep it out of landfill. So about 90% of food waste still goes to landfill and causes greenhouse gas emissions. So if we can push what's going into landfill up to composting, that's a great start. But what we want to do is try and keep as much food in the human food chain as possible. Now that can involve feeding animals or it can involve feeding hungry people such as food rescue, but we want to keep the food in the human food chain um, so we're not losing it to the environment and causing those environmental problems. So the organisation involves about $121 million worth of funding over the next 10 years and we've got one year that's gone, so another nine years ahead. Uh, 57 uh, all, uh, participants, most of them from industry, over 200 people involved at any one time. It's 10 years of funding, um, which is quite rare, and the economic return from us is expected to be over $2 billion, and I'm, I'm sure we will exceed that. This is just a picture of uh, our participants, and some of these organisations I'm sure you're very familiar with, um, certainly in South Australia, you know, companies like Piper Alderman, KPMG are well known, um, Pete Soils, Pete is uh, Pete Waterwitz, an absolute legend of this area, not just uh, in our state but nationally. Um, companies like Woolworths, uh, Thomas Food International, Matolo Group, uh, we've got most of the peak industry bodies involved, Food and Grocery Council, Institute of Food Science, and so on. Um, and then the Food Rescue, the two biggest food rescue organisations. Um, companies like Swiss, and people may, might say, well, why is a wellness company and vitamin company want to be involved in a food based CRC? Well, nearly all the ingredients that go into Swiss products are imported from overseas. Even things like grapeseed extract. Um, we do have a bit of a wine industry here. You think we could produce these things from our waste streams, but no, we import it all from France. Now, that in itself is, is crazy, um, and it just re requires some capital investment to set up the, the value chains in Australia, and that's what the CRC is focusing on. One thing I should certainly acknowledge is PERSA, Primary Industries and Reed in South Australia, was a proponent for this bid. That's where I was working before, and um, yeah, I think it's fantastic that the South Australian government really got behind this to get it up, um, because that's not normally the case with these property research centres. They normally come from industry or academia. So in terms of the opportunity in Australia, well, here's the value chain I mentioned before, and you can see where losses are occurring. Our solution to this is three key research and development programs, two, really two R&D programs, Reduce and Transform, and the Engage program is very much around consumer behaviour change. Now, I'm not going to go through all the projects that we've got going on. There's a lot of information on our website for anyone um, that's particularly interested. Uh, and I'm also happy to share uh, this presentation with you. I am going to touch on a couple of things so that you may find interesting. And one is this thing here. We, we had a show of hands before who's seen the war on waste. Uh, and one thing the war on waste didn't do as well as it could have is they demonised packaging. Now, I'm not going into bat for the packaging industry. We need to reduce packaging where possible. Uh, and avoid excess packaging, but packaging is critical to reducing food waste. And that's a real paradox. If we get rid of packaging, food waste will dramatic, uh, increase dramatically. And the easiest demonstration to show that is that you'd all be familiar with a continental cucumber wrapped in plastic. That cucumber will last three to four days on the shelf if it's not wrapped in plastic. It will last 14 days 
uh, on the shelf if it is wrapped in plastic. So that little bit of plastic on it makes that food last three, four times longer. And particularly if you're in a small household living by yourself, you cannot eat generally a cucumber that, you know, uh, without it going off before you finish it. So packaging is really important in reducing food waste, um, and particularly in modern society as we go to smaller homes and things like that. So we need to keep that in perspective, even though we need to reduce packaging overall. So Woolworths, as a supermarket chain, gets lots of questions around um, you know, wanting to reduce packaging. But they also get lots of questions around wanting to reduce food waste. And so this paradox is something they're dealing with all the time. So when you hear that argument and people saying, let's remove all packaging, understand that it is there for a purpose. Um, and uh, most of the carbon footprint in producing food is in the food production, not in the packaging. So if we get rid of the packaging, we actually waste the rest of it as well. Another really important area for the CRC is food rescue. Um, food Bank Australia do, well, has about 70% of the food rescue market in Australia, and there's the other couple of charities, Oz, Oz Harvest and Second Bite and so on. Their recent estimates are that uh, 65,000 people each month get turned away from food charities, not just theirs, but all of them, because we don't have enough food to go around. Now, in Australia, we produce enough food to feed 60 million people for a population of 25 million. Most of the rest is exported, but of course we're wasting 40%. So we should not have a situation where so many people are going hungry, being turned away from food charities because there's not enough food. Um, the figure I mentioned before is 4 million people each year in a population of 25 are food insecure. So at some point in that year, they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And again, in a wealthy country, that's just not good enough. The amazing return you can get in this area uh, yeah, is, is mind-blowing. In terms of, uh, and this is our target, develop and delivering an additional 60 million meals per annum, the return on investment here is something like 136 million um, dollars per annum, and that's a social return on investment. What that means is that kids that may not be able to get a good breakfast at home can be part of this breakfast program that Food Bank provide. They can get a decent breakfast and they can go into class and they can study and they can concentrate and they can contribute to society rather than languishing behind because they just don't have you know, food in their stomach to be able to concentrate. That's a very busy slide and no need to uh, take it all in. Um, but it just gives you some idea of what we deal with in terms of the different areas of the supply chain and the different techniques we use to create value out of what's traditionally seen as waste. Um, so whether it's mechanical, chemical, thermal or biological, we've got projects, lots of projects in each of these different areas and the end products here are feeding more humans, feeding more animals, developing high value products, and then things like industrial um, products, so you know, gas and diesel, all of which can be created from food waste. <coughs> so just to finish with, I'll give you some practical examples there. Here we have a decision support tool where if you've got a waste stream, this is what you can do with it. And these are the most valuable steps moving out from the centre. And you have to do it in a certain order, otherwise you destroy the value at the next step. Um, and one, um, so you can see the bread icon here, I think one classic product that's been developed in the last couple of years is this toast ale. We don't have it in Australia yet. It's beer that's um, brewed from day old bread. All that bread we talked about is thrown out before. Started off in the UK, um, and there's about a slice of bread in, in each, each beer. So you do have to drink a lot of beer, <laughs> Keep that in mind, but at least you can drink that beer and save the world at the same time. No, I think that's <laughs> and our last program is this Engage program. So not only is the CRC about good research, it's about training the future professionals in this area. And so we've got a target of 30 PhD students and 12 masters, and they'll work with companies like KPMG and so on to be mentored. So they come out as business graduates as well as science graduates. We've got this industry connection hub, which really connects all our peak industry bodies together. And just through that network there, we've got an Australian reach of something like 14 million people. So we can, we can get our message out 
to nearly half the, um, the country, which is fantastic. And the last area is this consumer behaviour change. Where, because most food waste occurs at the consumer end, unless we can do something here, and it's not necessarily with industry here, the industry isn't so interested, although Woolworths is very good in this area, it's mainly state governments and food rescue charities that want to see behaviour change here. And so that's the first time they've all come together on a large project. So, just to finish with the take home messages. Look, look at what you have, check the use by dates, and I'm sure I'll get a question around use by dates after the year, and rightly so, I look forward to it. Um, and plan your meals, uh, it's something we don't do as well uh, anymore. You only want to buy what you need, you need to shop with a list, and you need to avoid the deals. So, one thing that is often a trap is a two for one, two for one salads and things like that. Well, salad is actually one of the most perishable, perishable things out there. And those two for one salad bags, often the second one is normally uh, you know, half rotten by the time you get to it. In, the UK, in one of the UK supermarkets, they've stopped that practice and um, they've banned it. So now, you, if you buy the two for one deal, you can pick up that next salad when you come back the next time. And so it doesn't end up going to waste. We need to store food properly. And again, it's, um, I know I certainly grew up in the house of Tupperware, um, and uh, that tends not to be the case as much anymore. Uh, again, it's packaging and a play a real purpose. Um, keep fruit and veg in the fridge. Uh, well, it's lovely to have that big fruit bowl on the, on the bench um, and all the colour. That fruit bowl often end, ends up uh, you know, uh, degraded and thrown out because you just don't get to it in time. <coughs> and freeze food near its use by day. And finally, cook with what you have. And that's not necessarily the case these days. Uh, certainly the younger generation are very keen to get Uber Eats and things like that. It's just much easier. And that's often when we've got a fridge full of food. And you know, I'm sometimes guilty of that, leaving a busy lifestyle. So that's something that we need, really need to think about as well. Use ingredients up and love your leftovers. And again, you know, utilising all your leftovers is a bit of a dying arm. Speaking of which, and just to finish with, this post is actually from 75 years ago. I don't think the Department of Home Economics actually um, exists anymore in the US government, but there was a whole series of these posters during World War II, and they're all around um, fighting food waste in the home, making uh, the maximum amount of food available for the troops, um, and actually trying to win the war through managing food better. You know, there was a time when there was no food waste in Australia, or very little globally. If we talk about times of depression and so on, um, there was no food waste. Food waste is you know, a modern symptom of our society, but we do know that we can get back to a time where people cherish food a lot more, and that's around education. And that's a key purpose of the CRC. So with that message, I'll leave it there, but I will open it up to any questions. Thank you.